Welcome to the Waiting Warriors podcast. As loved ones of first responders and military personnel, we often face life situations and challenges that many others don't experience. And while each of us and our experiences are unique, together we can learn from one another and become stronger in this journey of life. Now let's step out of mediocrity. It's time to thrive. Hey, Waiting Warriors out there, welcome to another week. I know I say I'm excited very often, but this week I really am very excited to share with you Marla Bautista. She is someone I've been fangirling in the military spouse community since March, February. It's been the pandemic, so I'm kind of losing track of time, but it was earlier in the year. She is incredible. She's a wife to an active duty Army soldier. She's a mom to three, a writer, and a co-founder of a nonprofit with her husband. Welcome, Marla. Thank you so much for having me, Michelle. It is truly my pleasure. Um, So I, like I said before, I've kind of been fangirling. I know a bit of your story. Obviously, there's only so much you can learn about somebody from the internet. But I, I have totally seen this like theme of overcoming um like throughout your whole life and I really want to share that with our waiting warriors because I know that's what we have to do over and over and over again so can you kind of dive into that like what has I know that's like a totally broad question but like what has your life been like tell us your story um okay well I appreciate you having me on. Um, of course, I'm Marla. I'm the the imp of Miss Marla Bautista. <laughs> um, I am just a military spouse, um, like everyone else. Um, all the ladies and gentlemen out there, um, we go through a lot, um, and we are from all different walks of life. And me, I am from a very harsh part of life. Um, I had a really uh, uh, rough upbringing as a child. I lost um, both my parents prior to the age of 10 years old. Um, And I was left with a really abusive um, step parent who abused me until I was about 18 years old. Um, And then I was left out on the streets. Um, I I was left to be homeless. And um, it was just really hard because, you know, you're turning 18 and that's kind of like when you find yourself or you start learning about your adult self. Um, and I was homeless, so I had to learn how to survive. Um, and that was that was a really hard thing for me. Um, I slept in shelters. Um, I even went to jail. Um, there were just so many, so many things that happened um, that just made my life just difficult over and over and over again. Every time I thought I was coming up for air, I would start drowning again. And um, that was just kind of my life story um, up until my early 20s. And um, I used to go eat lunch at, at, a, at a Catholic church down in downtown Denver and um, when I was homeless. And there used to be this long line that wrapped around the building. And I remember um volunteers passing out like little hygiene bags it was like a little sandwich bag it had a like travel size deodorant and a two toothpaste and toothbrush in it and i promised myself that if i were to ever overcome my situation that i would spend my life um doing that doing the same thing that those people had done for me um Mm -hmm. and so that became my mission um i was always a giver i was always a really kind-hearted person um but to give back to people in need was something that just absolutely filled my heart day in and day out. Um, and so that's that's what I did. And so upon becoming a military spouse, um, I had all these grander plans of um, military spouse life. Um, it wasn't like the movies. Um, so I'm definitely <laughs> about that. Um, it was definitely a lot different than they showed on the TV. So um, that was something that I had to learn. I got married to my husband, Ulysses, about 30 days after we met. Um, so yeah, 30 days after we met, I was like, hey, let's do this. He was like, sure. And then 
it <laughs> happened. And honestly, um, I can sit here and say today that was probably the one of the most stupidest things I've ever done. But 13 years later, I am still doing it. So that is just like, that is the story of my life. Um, actually, I'm, I'm being funny, but more, I think I'm being funny, should I say. But um, I, I worked at a hotel um, when I was like 20, 23, 24 years old. And um, I was an administrative assistant. And we always used to get all these soldiers coming into the hotel. And they were all these chummy guys. What you know, they want to hit on everybody and all kind of stuff. And so the guys would always ask me like, hey, what's up? You know, where's all the cool clubs at? And you know, the hangout spots. And I'm like, I don't know. Like on Friday nights, I go to the laundromat. And if anybody wants to go to the laundromat with me, you are absolutely welcome to, and we can hang out and do whatever. And you know, all the guys are like, oh, that's gross. We're not doing that. That's lame. You know, and they're like, you don't know any clubs. I'm like, no, I said laundromat Friday night, you know, be there, be square type thing. And <laughs> so my husband was like, I'll go to the laundromat with you, you know? And I was like, what? And so for me, I was like all mesmerized because he was like this cute guy that wanted to do laundry. And so I was like, like, who gets that? You know what I mean? Like no woman, if there's a woman today <laughs> that can say that her husband like loves to fold clothes with her, like, let me know. <laughs> you found the you found the one I found the laundry unicorn um and so like um we go and so like Friday Friday came around I got off work or no it was actually the next day Saturday and so I was like hey I'll pick you up at the hotel and we can go do laundry so I pull up to the hotel where he's staying he was doing like training he was in the army reserves and he was doing training and um so I pull up to the hotel. This guy comes out of the hotel doors with his laundry bag. And I was like, seriously? And he's like, wait, wh why are you dressed up? I'm like, you're going to take me on a date. And he's like, what? I thought we were doing laundry. I'm like, yeah, like, yeah but no, too, you know? <laughs> and so like we ended up going out to eat at like um the ESPN sports bar and we went to go get something to eat and then we hung out and did adult things and then the next morning we did laundry um we did hold up that end <laughs> um and so you know 30 days later we were we were married and um I'm gonna tell you guys a secret he did not like doing laundry he lied <laughs> He absolutely <laughs> lied because he, I guess he didn't realize the amount of time it took to do laundry at a laundromat. Um, I lived in an apartment building. So, you know, when you have like your own place with the, you know, your own laundry room inside the house, you know, you can go put your clothes in and then walk away, leave it. You can even go places. You can't do that at the laundromat. Like you have to sit there and wait for your stuff. And I did all of my entire week's worth of clothes sheets, towels, everything that day. Um, so I'd spend a good three, four hours in the laundry rat. And so, you know, it, it wasn't something that he liked to do after all, let's just put it that way. <laughs> um, I mean, I loved it. Um, and so 30 days later, we were married. And then shortly after that, he um, decided to go active duty. Um, that was a decision we made together. Um, jobs were really hard to come by at the time. Um, and so he was already in the reserve. So why not? So he went active duty and we ended up getting orders to Schofield Barracks, Hawaii. Um, and I was not used to like following a husband um, because I never had one before. I was my own independent woman. I had my own place. I had my own vehicle. Um, and so we ended up getting to Schofield and they were like, well, Hey, you've got to go off to training. Um, as soon as we got the house, like we didn't even have our stuff yet. My car wasn't there yet. Like we absolutely had an empty house and he went off to training and come to find out that was training for him to deploy. <laughs> um, so our mm. first anniversary was spent with him in Iraq. Um, in 2008 was our first year anniversary and he was in Iraq. And so of course I did all crazy, 
girls do for their first anniversary and their husband's gone. I got a tattoo with his name on it on my arm. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's that. It's 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 a whole whirlwind of fun. Um, so mm-hmm. That was what I did. Um, and back in the day, I hate to say back in the day, but um, there was no like, FaceTime. Um, there was none of that was happening. There was Facebook was like becoming popular in like 2008, maybe, but it was like not really a thing. Yeah. Um, so we had like no way to yeah. instantly talk to each other unless he were, he was able to call on the phone. Um, and so like I was sending him a picture. So I sent him a picture and was like, happy anniversary. And it was his name. And he's like, that isn't my name. That's my son's name. I'm like, we don't even have a son. He's like, but I know if we had a son, you were going to name him Ulysses anyway. I'm like, you're right. But that's not the point. I was like, it's your name now. So yes, I have his name tattooed and it doesn't say junior. It just (laughs) says Ulysses, but I do have a son named Ulysses Jr. now. So it worked out for all of us. (laughs) Yes. It worked out for all of us. Um, But I had to like learn how to be a spouse and how I learned was by other military spouses that came before me. Um, And what they taught me was they taught me how to be a military spouse. They taught me how to volunteer. Um, They taught me how to wait for sure. That was one of the things they did very well. Um, And, you know, they... They taught me how to, they taught me all things army. So all things military related, I was like just plunged into. So I took all the classes. There was army family team building classes. Um, We volunteered for the FRG. Um, We did all of the things. We became sisters, our deployment sisters. Um, We did Thanksgivings together and all the holidays. And then Army Wives, the show came out was like real time you know on tv Mm. no such thing as netflix or anything back then and we watched it every week and we had like a mini potluck for our unit wives and so we all got together and we watched army wives together and we'd cry and it it was just it was that type of situation that real life army Mm. life um that is different now for sure um but that's what we used to do um and so over time it just it, that was just our life. And, you know, you got more um, consumed by military life as time went on, for sure. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like there was resistance in you because you had spent so much of your time not having anyone to rely on and not working around and not only like not working around anybody, but you you had to build everything for yourself because you had nothing. While most of us were thinking about what sheets we were putting on our dorm room bed, you know, like shopping with our parents, you were trying to find a home and a place to build yourself up. And like, but then now you're going from that extreme situation to an extreme situation of following, following, you know, Mr. Army around. Like, did you feel like there was a lot of resistance (laughs) or did you just kind of jive with it and flow? Um, I feel like um, initially there was just because I was that strong, independent woman and I had all of the things that I had, I built myself. Um, like you were saying, there was no one to hand me anything. Um, my house, you know, everything that I had was mine um, and I got it because of blood, sweat and tears. I absolutely didn't have anything handed to me. And so, yes, it was it was a little tough in the beginning, um, but I definitely transitioned into my role as a military spouse really well. Um, I, the first time um, I tried to get a job when we were in Hawaii, I went down to Waikiki and got a job like instantly at a nice hotel. And this was prior mm-hmm. to my husband's deployment. And I remember... Um, he was like, well, so how am I going to talk to you if I'm deployed and you're working? Like, what are you going to do? And I'm like, well, I mean, you're just going to have to like talk to me when you can talk to me. And I realized that that actually wasn't a thing back then. Um, I realized that there were military spouses who waited Mm. by the phone day in and day out and would stop their lives um, for their husband's phone call. 
And there's nothing wrong with that. I just, that was, that was new to me. I had never done that before. Um, and so I had to learn to do that. And so I didn't take the job um, because I didn't want to miss talking to my husband and financially uh, we were okay. Um, and so I didn't need to take the job. So I waited. Um, my husband got deployed. And like I said, I uh, dove into everything military spouse. I took all the classes. Um, I joined all the groups. I did all the the volunteering. Um, and I waited for those phone calls. Do you feel like that's because I know I know this is I know how I feel about it. But it's a question I get often is, is that a healthy thing for us to do? Like, or is there a medium that we need to find? Or does it, I mean, does it depend on each person? Um, I think as far as each individual, you will make your decision mm -hmm. how you make it. Um, but for me, it was not a healthy thing to do. Um, because I began to lose myself. I began to live my life for someone else. And in the meantime, I lost myself the more that I push myself to be there for that other person wholly I couldn't be there for myself um and that was really hard for me yeah. how do you I mean how do you come back from that because any any active duty military person and I know it's different or I know it's different for other um branches and jobs like with the um police officers or firewives, but they still kind of have their own version of you get immersed in this community. And it's like, it's not just mm -hmm. a job that your spouse is in. It really is a lifestyle. And to a degree, it has to be that way because of everything that it demands. Mm -hmm. Like you have to have that community, but how do we balance needing that community and really understanding what our spouses are doing and still being us and not becoming like, I don't know. Sometimes I picture what's that movie, like the Stepford wives, you know, like when they yes. become robots and like everybody <laughs> learns how to cook perfectly and, um, to exercise, right. you know, like you could insert those, whatever that is for your husband's life. You know what I mean? Like, not that volunteering's bad, right. but like everybody becomes a super volunteer and everybody becomes right. camo wearing and I don't know, like <laughs> tattoos of their husband's name, right. like whatever it is. Right. Like, Okay, I, I triggered. I'm triggered. Um, hey, I feel like you're talking about my camo purse that I got with my husband's <laughs> rank on it. I still have that purse. Are you kidding me? <laughs> um, so I absolutely do have that purse in my closet right now. And it has the patches on it. It had his rank on it. Absolutely, it did. And I was that wife. I, I absolutely was. Um, and you're right. It's something that we kind of get sucked into. Um, times are different now. I don't think it's the same um, because we have that sense of community online that we didn't before. Um, before we just had each other. Um, and when you were stationed in remote locations, uh, we were in Hawaii and then we moved to Germany. Um, we moved to Germany in about 2011. So that's when like more of the, the internet things started yeah. happening. Now I feel old with internet things. Um, but well, young that's people all and your internet things. stuff. Right. <laughs> like, what do, you, what do you do? But um, that's when all of that stuff started happening. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, at that point, honestly, I had lost myself. Um, and I didn't realize I lost myself um, until we had a bout of infidelity um, in our marriage. Um, and that's when I realized I was gone. Um, when I found out my husband had, uh, I don't call it an affair, a situation, mm -hmm. ooh, an entangled <laughs> yet. <laughs> an entangled <laughs> Sorry to say that. I don't mean to laugh about it. It's not a funny matter. Um, but at least we, the yeah. word was kind yeah. of funny. The, the word choice <laughs> um, is a clever, witty right. word choice. 
<laughs> but um, that's when I realized, honestly, that I had lost myself. I was giving every single thing that I had to my soldier and it wasn't enough. And when I found out about the infidelity, I was like, okay, so this is me. I am not enough. And I realized I was, I had um, a kid who just got diagnosed with autism. I had, I just had another baby. I was in college. Like I was doing all of, I was volunteering. I was doing so many different things and taking care of my husband and cooking and cleaning and doing all the things. And he was, you know, out there and it wasn't enough. And so I realized that I had lost myself. Um, and I promised myself at that point that um, I would never let that happen to me again. I would, I would always, and, and I don't mean stop loving your spouse. Mm -hmm. We went to counseling, we did all of the things um, and things were better. This wasn't a reoccurring situation that we had. Um, but still I had that resentment of losing myself, of giving that 100% to someone else to where it took away from me. And I felt lost. I felt lost as if like, how could you, you know, how could you do this to me when I gave all of myself to you? And I had to realize um, that he was human. And I had to realize that honestly, it isn't up to someone else to make you happy. Mm -hmm. It is up to you to be happy with yourself and anyone that is in your life will get to experience that happiness with you, but you have to be happy with yourself. Um, and I think that's something that, um, we negate quite often as military spouses, mm -hmm. um, we don't take as good of care of ourselves as we should. Um, and there's this whole stigma of, if you're a military spouse, you've got to do all the mm -hmm. things. And if you don't, then you're not as good as the other military spouses who do all the things. And that is absolutely not the truth. Um, and so fast forward 13 years later, um, I, you know, have friends that I have a friend right now, she's going for her doctorate. And I'm like, I was president of spouses club and I met her at therapy for our sons. Um, our, my son has autism. And so he goes to speech and OT therapy. And I met her there and I'm the president of spouses club. So I'm like, you need to come to my event. And she's like, girl, I have a job. I go to school. I do all the things. I don't even want to go on post. And I'm like, how dare you? You know, <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm this army spouse. You know what I mean? And, you know, hanging out with her more. I was like, wait, you have your own life you do your own thing and she's like absolutely I do and so I was like whoa so this kind of opened my eyes to like this it's okay to be yourself it's okay to have your own life and still be a military spouse and it doesn't take anything away from you if you're going to school if you have a full-time job if you absolutely don't live on post and don't do anything with the military community that's also okay mm -hmm. And you're, you're a really good example of that because you very much so are you, at least, I mean, from my point of view, you're very much so you, and yet there is a huge amount of military spouses that like, are like, go Marla. She is, you know, the epitome of an awesome military spouse. And yet not every thing that you do goes back directly to the military. Do you know what I mean? Like you, you yes. do so uh, much, but it's like, you're not plastered in camo. You're not, do you know what I mean? Anymore. Yeah. Anymore. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I still have the stuff, Michelle. So, okay. You're <laughs> no, 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 I, ju I, I just, I'm stuff. just trying to be a picture and I'm not bashing the stuff. Camo's not my thing. I, you know, it does not work well with super pasty complexion, Michelle. Other oh people it works for, but not. <laughs> but we're not going to talk about my army wife hoodie. <laughs> no, no, no. So. I would never, I would never bash the gear. I was just using that as a talking point. <laughs> but it's absolutely like so funny because it's true. Mm -hmm. It's true. I had to kind of evolve um, into. I had to evolve into myself. Mm -hmm. 
And I know that's crazy um, for people to understand, but there is a lot of times where you're either in high school and you're kind of hanging out with this crowd of people and you kind of mold yourself into into who they are and you know you want to hang out with them so you want to be like them and all these things and it's the same thing in our lives today as military spouses um i jumped in head first i got the purse you know that was my initiation into the gang and then <laughs> and you know all the things i mean i did all of the things and and you can do all of the things um but you don't have to be all of those things um, you can do them without letting them absorb you. Um, and that's something that I had to learn again the hard way. Um, I still volunteer. I still do a lot of things that support the military community. Um, but I also am able to now say, hey, it's a little bit too much for me. Um, and I can't do all of the things. Um, my husband is in the army and I will volunteer when I'm able to. Um, but I don't have to let it consume me. And I also don't have to feel bad if I don't want to do the things and you don't let any other spouse shame you, um, because you're not doing them. And we have a really good way of shaming other spouses. Yeah, we absolutely do. Um, there has been so much bullying since this whole internet thing started with the young people. Um, yeah, <laughs> this, even... this, it's a whole different lifestyle now from when my husband went active duty because we didn't have the Facebook things. So life was looked a little different, but today it is so rampant and toxic and we need to be able to support one another. Um, I told the story of our first duty station. Um, and when we moved to Hawaii and when my husband came back, we were family. Our unit was an entire family. Like there was people that didn't like each other. There was people that loved each other, um, but we were still all together. Mm -hmm. You know, it was no, you know, big messy situation. Like if you were messy, you were gonna be messy within that unit um, because you had nowhere else to go or no one else to talk to. You know, there was no, yeah. no Facebook and all that stuff. Um, and so we were still a family and we were such a tight knit family back then. And you knew all of your neighbors, you knew everything that was going on and the whole neighborhood, at least my neighbor did, my next door neighbor, she knew all the things, all of them. Um, and so like, you knew everyone, I mean, all the way down your street, you knew everyone. Mm -hmm. um, your kids could go outside, you knew, you know, whose house your kids were going to be at, um, you know, that your kids were eating at someone else's house. And, you know, all of the things was happening, you know, all the jobs that everyone's husbands or spouses had. Um, and it's so different today. Today, I literally could tell you a couple of names of my neighbors. And di I didn't know all of their kids names. I I didn't know everybody's name. I didn't even know who they were. Um, and I was like, that's sad. Like, we don't have that sense of community anymore um, because we all stick to ourselves. And the problem with that is when things happen and when we need to lean into our village, it's non-existent. So how do you how do you balance that, though? Because on one hand, it's like, OK, we need to be healthy. We need to not lose ourselves. We need to not just. um conform and like become enveloped in the community but then on the other hand we need to be good neighbors and we need to know who our community is so then we have something to rely on like where what are do you have any like spe more specific things on where we can draw that line for ourselves so i think we can find a happy medium um by making our own friends um this is not a, uh, what do you call it? The arranged marriage type situation <laughs> where yeah. our friends are often arranged for us as military spouses. You're like, okay, this is my husband. This is my husband's unit, or this is my spouse's unit. These are the people that are in my spouse's squad. Their spouses are now your friends. Welcome. 
friends. Mm -hmm. No, you don't have to do that. You can honestly go find your own friends, go to spouses club events, go to events within the community and make your own friends. And that way you can maintain your own identity when making those friends. You don't have to feel like you have to put on a show um, because these people are in your husband's unit or your spouse's unit. Um, you can just be yourself. And that's one thing that I, I want to kind of um, work into these spouses' lives is, is to maintain your own identity um, and find your passion and find a community that is also passionate about the same thing you're passionate about. I love volunteering. That's my thing. Whether it's in the military community or not, I'm going to be volunteering. So what can I do? I can find people who like to volunteer like me. Um, and that doesn't have to be within my spouse's unit. That can be someone at the SPCA um, that also likes to volunteer. You know, that can be someone you met at um, a Facebook art group um, or white walls on Facebook. You know, make your own friends, you know, allow yourself to be yourself. And that's something that I think Again, we we've lost sight of that, but I I feel like we're re evolving back into ourselves as military spouses. I mean, there are so many spouses doing amazing things um, on their own, and I love seeing that. I love seeing us go get your education, go to school, you know, do these things that you wanted to do with your life. Continue to chase your dreams, and I think that that was something that I didn't do. Um, initially, because I thought I had to give them up to be a military spouse. And you absolutely do not. Um, you can continue to go after your passion. You can continue to um, chase your dreams. You can get a higher education um, and you can go have that amazing career that you want. Um, you just have to find that happy medium. And you do so by by being honest with yourself and being honest with your spouse. Communicate those wants and those needs to your spouse. You know, have a talk about it. Say, hey, I really love what you're doing and I love volunteering or I want to be a part of this, but I also want to maintain my own identity. And mm -hmm. your spouse should support that. Um, and if you have any issues with that, um, I always suggest going to counseling. And I don't mean you don't have to go to counseling if you have a marital issue. So I don't know how they do it now, but back in the day, again, um, we used to have pre-deployment counseling. It was like counseling for everything. If you, if mm -hmm. anything was changing within our military lifestyle, you should just go to counseling, um, to make sure that you and your spouse were on the same page during that change. Um, so my husband and I, we went to pre-deployment counseling. We talked about our expectations in deployment. Um, we talked about, you know, what what communication would look like during deployment. Did I expect him to write paper letters? Well, I'm a writer, so absolutely, I want to get a piece of mail from you. Um, that was something that um, we talked about, our expectations. We talked about, you know, even like, you know, sexual things like, are we going to have phone sex? I'm weird about it. I don't really want to do that. So <laughs> we talked about those things, but that is something that we need to do as military spouses um, is have those hard conversations because it's so much easier to have that hard conversation now than to have that unspoken expectation later, you know? Yeah, I'm dealing with that. Yeah. I don't know about everywhere else. I know for us, we didn't have pre-deployment or the post-deployment counselings like mm -hmm. just thrown at us, but there is the military one source. Okay. Like you get, and an, I think it's like 10 or 12 um, per topic mm -hmm. free sessions. So there's still a way that you can do that. And I totally agree with that. Like don't wait until you have a big problem to talk about things or to talk about things with a counselor, like somebody who is there to, even if they don't say much, but they're just there to like help balance you guys out and help you not get angry or like defensive and stuff. That's super helpful to have the third party there. Absolutely. I agree. You need that non-biased um, mediator in a sense. Everybody doesn't need that, but me and my husband definitely need that. We need that to decide what we're going to have for dinner. Um, <laughs> so it can, we can go into an all out war about dinner. Like he's like, well, yeah. you know, I'm like, well, what do you want to eat? He's like, I don't care. 
And I'm like, well, let's go to this place. He's like, no, I don't want that. I'm like, you just said you didn't care though. So then it's a whole thing, you know? And so absolutely, you know, if you need that person, recognize that you need that middleman and say, hey, you know what? Like you said, Michelle, Military One Source is an absolutely great resource because you can call them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, even from overseas for free. And you can just chat with them on the phone immediately and say, hey, I just want to talk about this. I just, I'm feeling some type of way and I just want to get another opinion about it. I just want to get an idea of, you know, am I crazy or is this normal? And, you know, a lot of times the things that we're going through are normal, like that pre-deployment funk in your relationship. Mm -hmm. That is so normal. And I absolutely think every time he's going to leave, we're going to get divorced. No, (laughs) absolutely not. But the thing is that you need to know that those those fights are normal. Your emotions are changing. Um, Things are getting tense. And yeah, you're going to, you know, take out a little bit of anger and frustration on each other. And so being aware of that helps. So now, like we have a whole system. There are certain things that our family can do that your family may not be able to do. Um, When it comes time for like deployments or time for my husband to leave, I tell him leave silently. Do not roll up the kids um, because we don't like that whole big thing of leaving because it makes us an emotional wreck. Um, I'll cry. My kids are crying. It's like a whole scene from like, you know, you're stripping the kids from their parent type scene in a movie. Like, we don't need to do all that. Leave quietly. When the kids ask me, where's daddy? Daddy's at work. And that's fine. I did it for an entire year straight. Daddy's at work. When's daddy coming home? He'll be home soon. I've done it. (laughs) It's possible. Um, and it's not the the most ideal situation, but that's what works for my family. Um, what works for your family may be those big deployment situations and, you know, everybody crying, but that doesn't help my family stay positive. That doesn't strengthen us as a family. That makes us emotional um, and it drains us physically um, because now we're remembering and we feel like bad things are going to happen and everyone's talking about it at school. You know, the kids are talking about it. It's just, it gets really sticky. And so for us, you know, you've, you've got to do what's best for your own family. And that's another big piece of our lifestyle is that we a lot, um, we talk about what works for us, um, what duty stations we like. Um, and we don't realize that your experience may be completely different from mine. So you should be taking what I say as a military spouse with a grain of salt. If I say I hated this duty station, you might say you love the exact same duty station. Um, you know, if I say I hate housing over here, you may love it. So we've got to realize that their experience may not be our own. And that's why we need to form our own opinions. And that's why we need to establish a solid foundation within our own homes with our own spouses and we also need to have outside Mm -hmm. friends um outside of our spouse relationships totally agree so what is your key to thriving you want to share with your fellow waiting warriors i think um to thrive in this lifestyle in this military lifestyle culture um maintain your identity. Um, Keep yourself busy with something that you love to do. Um, Whatever your passion is, um, if you know what that is, great. Can you give like, what's, what's an example of the way of how you do that? Um, How I do that is by um, bullet journaling. So take time and just journal, journal about the things that you like, journal about the things that you don't like. And I love this because it is a great way to not only brain dump and kind of get those funky thoughts out, but it's also a way to find out your true self. Um, You can also take an Enneagram test. I don't know. That's kind of a thing right now. Um, (laughs) But definitely, again, I'm old school, grab a pencil and journal it out. You know, talk about those hard things and even talk to a counselor yourself. 
go to counseling yourself. That is an amazing way to find out who you truly are. Allow a counselor to hear your thoughts, your truth, and speak the truth to yourself. Um, speak the truth to your spouse and um, speak the truth to a counselor and just allow yourself to be open and honest. And I think that's a great way to find out who you are, to find out what your passion truly is. Whatever you do, be able to do that, whether you were getting paid or not, that's a passion. Mm -hmm. If you love being around animals and you can do it, whether, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for no money, and you would just wake up happy every day, then do that. For me, giving back to others is my passion. It fills my heart with joy, um, taking care of communities. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something that I love to do. Um, so you definitely need to spend time alone. Um, and I don't mean just, you know, when your husband's deployed and you're with your other friends, spend time alone when your spouse is there too. you know, take a little bit of time. And I'm not saying, you know, all day, every day, but spend 15 to 30 minutes alone, you know, with your own thoughts and say, you know, I feel like this about this situation mm -hmm. or, you know, just so that you're okay. And you're sitting with yourself because a lot of times our judgment can be clouded by the things happening around us. There's so much happening in military spouse life. Um, we're thinking about deployments. We're thinking about PCSs. We're thinking about our spouses going off to school. We're thinking about our children's situation. We're thinking about COVID. Are you kidding? Yeah. Like there's just so many things that are happening that we don't even get a chance to just sit with our own thoughts. Um, and that's definitely something that I'm struggling with right now because I have no idea if my kids are even going to school. And so I'm stressing about that. And that stress is being placed onto my family. You know, whether we know it or not, whether it's intentional or not, our family feels our stress. Our family feels the emotions that we're feeling. If we're happy, more than likely your household is going to be a happy one. If you're upset and angry all the time, more than likely your household is going to feel that too. Yeah. They follow suit. They follow the vibe always. It's crazy. For sure. Thank you so much. I feel like you dropped like a whole lot of wisdom and we're, I mean, very open about your experience, which I love because I think it's good to show how we are all so similar and yet how we are all different and how I love how much we can learn from each person's experience. Um, real fast, you talked a lot about how you give back or that you do give back so much to the communities. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about the Bautista project? I know you have the um, website, the Bautista project, inc.org. Um, yeah. Can you talk about how, what, what exactly you do and maybe how people can get involved if that's something that they, you know, would love to do? Absolutely. Um, the Bautista Project is a nonprofit organization um, that provides basic living essentials for homeless community members. Um, currently, we're stationed in Tampa at McDill Air Force Base. Um, so this is where our nonprofit is now. Um, and we are providing for the homeless community members here in Tampa. Um, so what we do is we go out and we hand out um, food. We have snack packs, which are sack lunches that my husband, myself, and my children, we make. Um, and we go out and we hand them out to the streets. Um, we've handed out masks recently. Um, I had a friend who donated 150 masks to us, disposable masks, and we donated those. Um, and we take them directly to the people in the street. We take them directly to the homeless community members, um, because that is so important to me. Um, there are a lot of organizations out there um, that have, you know, these huge organizations and foundations with these big companies, these big CEOs with these big salaries. Ours isn't like that. And I believe that it's because of my experience um, with homelessness. Um, it's because I know that they need every dime that they can get. They need every resource that they can get to overcome that lifestyle. Um, and so we hand out food, we hand out hygiene, we hand out clothing items as well. Um, currently, we're in the process of 
um, sewing belonging blankets. Um, and we actually make blankets out of military uniforms that have been donated to us by um, current and former soldiers or service members, should I say, any branch. Um, and so we love doing that. And those blankets are actually only given to children who are in group homes, foster care, or outside of their natural home setting. Um, and the reason why we do this is because of, again, my childhood. Um, there was a lot of times I didn't have things. Um, and so I want to give the kids something that belongs to them. Um, something that no one else can take away. Um, that was so important to me um, to make sure that they had something to call their own. And so we make these blankets and pillows for them and we give that to each individual's child. Um, and it's theirs for life. And those blankets are not only something to make them feel like they belong, but it also gives them courage and bravery because every one of those blankets comes with a story. Um, the story of a military hero who had to also persevere and show bravery and courage um, in their job. And so the kids love that. They love to hear the stories of the soldiers in, who wore their uniform. So when we, we do collect them, we kind of ask the soldier like, hey, what do you do for a living? You know, is there any cool stories you can tell us about you know, these uniforms. So we've gotten uniforms from like people who worked in EOD and like Navy SEALs and all kind of stuff like that. We've gotten uniforms also from my husband, who is a geospatial engineer who sits at a desk and, you know, <laughs> does the desk stuff. I don't know. He he distributes snacks to his soldiers for a living. <laughs> <laughs> don't tell them I said that, but that is something that the kids need to hear. They need to hear those stories um, mm -hmm. because it helps them get through their life. Um, it helps them know that if they continue on and, and exude that strength that they've been given with these blankets, that they can make it through anything. And I think that is just, that is just so important. I believe that all children need to know um that they have potential in all things um and so that's what we're doing right now we're preparing for um our belonging blanket mission we absolutely have no sewing experience this is also one of those situations where we probably should have went to pre-sewing ca uh, counseling but <laughs> we didn't we just you know youtube it out and you know, we've been doing this for a few years now um, and it's worked for us and I believe we're getting better at it. Um, yeah. But it's just something we love to do. If you'd ever want to help us out, um, you can always donate to the Bautista Project via our website. Um, you can go to www.thebautistaprojectinc.org. Um, we also have an Amazon wish list there where we collect hygiene products and other items that we need for the organization. Again, every single dollar that we get is put back onto the streets. Um, we do not collect a salary. We're all volunteer ran. Um, no one gets a check. And this was actually a self-funded mission up until a couple of years ago. Um, we did this out of our own pockets. And so it's just it's just something that's very important to us. We believe that homeland, homelessness should not exist. Um, there are a lot of communities that receive a lot of money um, to combat homelessness. And we are committed to ending it. I'm going to do it. You are. I'm sure you are. And I love that we can help you even in, like, honestly, an Amazon wish list. Like that's, that's so easy to help out or sending a uniform. If you have one, I mean, we all have one, like we all have old uniforms that our husbands can't use anymore. So we might as well make a really cute blanket for a kid who needs some love. Yes, please do. And you know, we can't return them. For sure. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Marla, thank you so much. Guys, please reach out. Please see how you can help or just spend some time with yourself, like Marla said, and, you know, forget about Marla and I and just <laughs> spend some time with yourself. See what are ways that, you know, are things that are just like, you know, I really don't actually like that or I like this, but I'm not doing it in a way that's like totally true to you. And then, shift it because I'm a big believer that you need you, your family needs you and the military or law enforcement or firefighter community need you, not some 
robot, but you. Absolutely. Go. Thank you so much, Marla, and all you waiting warriors out there. Just remember, just because it's hard doesn't mean it has to be miserable. Have a good week, guys. If you followed me on Instagram last year during Austin's deployment, you know I love Red Friday. Remember, everyone deployed. But since I could never find a style and shirt that I really loved, I created one, and they are launching this week on October 20th. So if you are listening to this after October 20th, go to teespring.com slash stores slash the dash waiting dash warrior and get your shirt on a super launch week special discount. Don't worry, the link will be in the show notes. It's on my website under shop and in my Instagram bio. There are sizes and styles for literally everyone. Launching prices will only last until October 24th though, so don't miss out.